You're in the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. A very special episode upcoming this week on the Paracast. We're going to be featuring Eric Von Daniken making his first appearance on the show. We'll also be joined by David Halperin, who was years and years ago, I don't want to say centuries, but years and years ago, he's one of the original teen ufologists, a very close friend of mine, and now he's a scholar. David, welcome back to the Paracast. Glad to be here, Gene. Eric Von Daniken, I have read and heard of your material for many, many years. We're glad to finally get you on the show. And I think the most important thing we want to start with is when you first got started with Chariots of the Gods, what got you interested in the possibility of ancient astronauts? Oh, God. That's a long story. I tried to make it short. I we have the time. We have Catholic. the time. I was educated in Switzerland as a Catholic. And of course, as a young boy, I was a deep believer in God. By the way, I still am a deep believer in God. But as a boy, God had to, ha- had to have some quality. For example, God makes no mistake. Or God does not need a vehicle in which to move from point A to point B. God is all over, etc. Now, I was educated for six years in a Catholic boarding school where we have to make translations of the Bible from Greek to Latin and from Latin to German. And while making these translations, I learned that the God of the Bible, sometimes he makes mistakes and he definitely uses vehicles in which to move around from point A to point B. For example, in the second book of, book of Moses, you read before the Lord descends on the holy mountain, he gives order to Moses that Moses should construct a gate around the mountain so that the people would not come close by because the people would be destroyed. So Moses constructs the gate and the Lord descends with fire and smoke and trembling noise and the whole mountain looked like a fern age. So I simply as a boy had to translate these things. I mean a boy, 17 years old. I had to translate these things and I had doubts in my own religious education. I wanted to know if other communities in antiquity have similar stories or if only we Christians and Jewish have these traditions. And that was the beginning. The doubts in religion was the beginning of chariots of the gods. Okay, so if we're assuming here that the God depicted in the Bible is an imperfect being, what does that make that person or individual? Well, in the Bible, he educates humans. In the Bible, he even takes some humans to some space places. For example, there was the seventh patriarch, the seventh after Adam. His name was Enoch. Enoch was the seventh patriarch before the great flood. Enoch was taken up by the extraterrestrials or a so-called God into a mother spaceship. Of course, the Bible does never speak about the mother spaceship. They had no words in technology. They speak about he was taken into the heaven. Finally, Enoch is the, the first human who disappears on our solar system in a fiery chariot. Enoch left before the great flood, the earth in a fiery chariot. Now, the same Enoch is the author of a book which is not part of the Bible. The book was founded in 170 years ago in an old convent library in Ethiopia. And there in the book of Enoch, he speaks in the first person. He tells what happened to him. There were two beings coming down from space. They spoke already their language, which is not a surprise. They observed the community like ethnologists would to the they took him up into a gigantic building, which he does not call heaven. He's in there, he learns the language of the extraterrestrials. And then they teach him in different sciences. For example, the astronomer says, You human, look out of the window. Do you see this little light out there? You humans call it the moon, but the moon has no light by itself. The moon receives his light from the sun. And then he explains him the moon phases. So why is the moon sometimes full or half full or empty, etc.? All right. You're not repeating that in biblical language. You're translating words yes, and modernizing course. them. Yes, exactly. That's what I'm doing because we have to do it. 
You see, the biblical language makes really no sense. It's full of contradictions. Soon as you look at it with our eyes, then it makes a certain sense. That's not only with the biblical traditions or with several other uh, holy books of other communities. In India, we have old holy books. When you look at them with modern eyes, many stories of them make, make perfectly sense. So the key here is that the only way to understand it is to take the language of its time and make a good guess? Yes. Yes, that's exactly the same. You see, when someone in antiquity was taken up into heaven, we think heaven, according to tradition, is a, a place of happiness. Heaven is a place where the angels are. Heaven is a place where the humans after death came to heaven. They are united with God. But then you learn in, in holy books that at the same heaven, there was a war. For example, in our Christian tradition, there was a war in heaven. One day, an archangel with the name of Lucifer came up with his people to the throne of the Almighty God. And he says, we do not serve you anymore. Then the Almighty God asked for the help of the archangel Michael and put Lucifer out of heaven. Now, Heaven in tradition should be the place of happiness. In a place of happiness where you are united with God, there is no war. There is no opposition. Everyone is happy. So we need new translations. It was not heaven. It was space. And soon, as you know, other traditions of other people around the world, some thousands of years ago, you find the same situation. They speak about a war in heaven, in space. David, what's your feeling about this? Well, I think I would prefer to give more respect to the perceptions of the ancients and not immediately translate heaven into space. That You know... No, go ahead. Yeah. You know, by looking these old traditions with new eyes, you never lose God. Let's imagine that my point of view would be correct. So we were visited by... by okay, so the next question would be, where did these aliens come from? What evolution do they have? What was their creation? You could go on and speculate and you could say, they were visited by another solar system. You can play back this game for millions of years. Finally, you arrive to a starting point where in every respect with religion, you say, and here is God. Here is the beginning. Here is creation. I never lost my God. I am still one of the personalities who prays every day. I'm not worried about your losing God. What I'm worried about is you're losing the ancient human beings and their perceptions. They look up to the sky and they do not see a gradually thinning atmosphere followed by blackness. They look up and see an, uh, 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 how, what's the word I'm looking for? In an inexplicable, mysterious realm of blueness where clouds sail and where the sun and the moon drive like chariots across the heaven day after day. Now, we would say this is not true, the, 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 that we discarded these images. But it seems to me that to understand ancient texts on their own terms, we have to get into the worldview of the people who wrote them. Guys, let's do our break and we'll continue. We have Eric Von Daniken and we have David yes, Halperin. Sir. More to come. You're in. The Paracast. We also have swag. You know, we have all these exclusive Paracast things that you can buy. We've got like, I guess, 60 or so different items and entails T-shirts, sleeves for notebook computers, iPad cases, mouse pads, the Paracast Jumbo tote bag, all sorts of T-shirts and jackets and stuff like that for men and women. 
we have a Paracast aluminum water bottle. All this stuff, you go to store.theparacast.com, store.theparacast.com. What makes it special is that the items are the best quality, you know, great T-shirts, fabrics, and they have our official logo on them. That's what makes them special in multiple sizes and colors. We even have stuff for children, stuff for women, stuff for men. We have all sorts of sizes, like small up to X large. A lot of good stuff. That's the swag from the Paracast. You go to store.theparacast.com, stop by, and take a shopping tour. With uncertain times in the United States, it's only prudent to consider storing precious metals in a safe place outside of our borders. At Miles Frank Limited, we have done just that for you. Partnered with the most respected storage company in the industry, Miles Frank Limited is proud to offer the only fully insured private safe deposit box system in North America, held in Vancouver and Toronto. Send us your previously purchased precious metals or have one of our brokers help you purchase something new. Questions? Please call one of our experienced brokers at 866-485-4346. Solid foundational storage partnered with the most respected name in security. That's Miles Franklin Limited. Celebrating our 29th year in business without ever receiving a customer complaint. Call us at 866-485-4346. Again, that's 866-485-4346. Miles Franklin Limited. A name you can trust. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. I'm here to tell you about GCNTelecare.com, a team of board-certified doctors assisting you 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. Within 15 minutes of registration, care your family can afford. Revolutionizing the healthcare industry, virtual consulting, providing diagnosis of non-emergency medical issues by phone or secure video on computer or smart mobile devices. GCNTelecare.com, virtual care anywhere. People search the internet for everything, including you. With a few clicks, information from your past can be quickly discovered. From business deals gone wrong, to misleading reviews, negative articles, and unflattering images. Studies show 78% of people search for someone online before doing business with them. Will they find the real you? With ReputationDefender.com, you can establish a positive internet presence. ReputationDefender.com pioneered the field with over a decade of experience, serving thousands of successful individuals and businesses. We use patented, award-winning systems to boost positive content and suppress negative material. Don't let the internet define you. Take control of your reputation today with ReputationDefender.com. For your quick, free reputation analysis, call 800-831-0771. That's 800-831-0771, 800-831-0771, or visit reputationdefender.com. This is Dan Pillard. Do you owe the IRS money you can't pay? Are tax debts crippling you? I've defended people from the IRS for over 30 years. I've helped thousands, and I can help you too. I wrote the book on IRS settlement, and I'm telling you, there's no such thing as a hopeless case. Call 800-34-NO-TAX to finally get free of IRS debt. With the IRS's new programs, there's never been a better time to solve your problem. Call 800-34-NO-TAX. That's 800-34-NO-TAX or my website, danpilla.com. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Eric Von Daniken visits us on the Paracast with my old friend David Halperin. Eric, you had a comment in response to what David just said. Yes, and I fully agree with David. Of course, our ancestors, they knew nothing about astronomy. They were looking to the skies. They could not understand the stars. They could not understand where the moon is here and sometimes disappear. And it was all a, a world of miracle for them. I fully understand this position. But in this world of miracle, there were always so-called gods coming down. And these gods, they were teacher. They teach men in, in, in several belongings. And this is not only part of the Bible, texts of old India, of old Tibet, of Central America, etc. It's always the same story. These teachers, they give information 
And that's the difference between nature. Thousands of years ago, there were a natural storm or an earthquake or lightning. And our ancestors had no idea of astronomy or physics. So they believed that these natural events were gods, made by the gods. So the first religions probably were natural religions. But this does not explain why some of the beings who came down were teachers to humans. Then they were information, and they taught them in astronomy, in different belonging, which has nothing to do with earthquake, with storm, and whatever. There was information in the past. And the person who knows these old texts, by the way, in the meantime, I'm 83 years old. So a person who knows these old texts, I can compare texts in the Bible with other old scriptures. I have no question, no problem with the text you quote being actual documents. I mean, you're not making these things up. Uh, At the same time, I do wonder if you're putting them in their proper place. For example, you speak of the Ethiopic Book of Enoch, in which Enoch speaks in the first person and tells his adventures. You must know that the overwhelming consensus of scholars is that these are books written in Enoch's name, a kind of imaginative fiction written probably from the second century BCE onward, that this is what people imagined you would see if you were carried up into heaven. Now, if you want to argue that that Enoch actually wrote this, just being a uh, just being uh, solitary, just being that you're you're alone in this, doesn't mean you're wrong. But you do have to, it seems to me, run your readings of Enoch in competition with those of the ones that are much more widely accepted. Am I making sense? I fully understand you, because I know the comments of so many brilliant theologians who explained Enoch in different ways. But do not forget, the book of Enoch is written in the first person, in the I version. He was there. And at the end, before he leaves our planet, he gives his books. He has written many books, he says. He gives these books to his son, Methuselah. Methuselah in the Bible, and he says, and now, my son Methuselah, I give you these books written by your father's hand. Keep it for the generations after the great flood. Now, if someone would have taken just Enoch's name and misused it, this would would all be a terrible lie. He could not say, and now, my son Methuselah, I give you these books. Keep them for the generations after the great flood. So it would all just be mixed up. I rather believe that the biggest part of Enoch are reality written by him, but in fact, not everything. During centuries, always other texts have been added to Enoch, as to the other old texts, by the way, too. This happened in the Bible, too. For example, in the Bible, we know everyone knows the story of the Great Flood. But the Great Flood story has existed long before Bible. In the Sumerian Gilgamesh epic, you read about the same story of the Great Flood. While in the Bible, the story is handed down in the third person. And he, Noah, did construct the ark. In the Gilgamesh epic of the Sumerian, it's written down in the first person. And I did construct it, etc. There are some little differences. Would you consider the possibility that a writer can write imaginatively in the first person of someone whom he's never known and never seen and who never existed. Homer has no problem doing that, writing Odysseus's adventures in the first person. You and I have no problem doing that, for I've written novels in the first person. Why should we deny our predecessors (laughs) the same talent? Well, I certainly accept your position. I have written myself novels in the first person. Many authors have written novels in the first person, but then it's fiction. It should not have become a holy book for mankind. And Enoch should not become one of the 
the seventh patriarch should not be a prophet in the Bible, then he's simply a liar. You are pointing to what I think is a real problem. And this is the problem. It's usually called the problem of pseudepigraphy. Most scholars will start out with the assumption that the authors of the Book of Enoch were, there seemed to be more than one author, that they were anonymous people writing in the name of Enoch. And the question becomes, how could they do this? This, it seems to me, is a psychological question that has not been adequately answered. I can take stabs at it, but I still see it as as a difficult problem. It seems to me much easier to deal with this problem than to assume that Enoch actually existed and that the fantastic things that he speaks of are things that happen in real history. We, we have uh, to compare another personality in the Bible. We have the so-called prophet Ezekiel in the Bible at the end of yes. the Old Testament. Ezekiel describes how he sees a flying chariots coming down. He describes the wheels and the legs and the metal. He even describes the noise, etc. Now, yes. of course, I know that many biblical scholars say that Ezekiel simply had a vision. He yes. saw the Lord uh, on his throne, wagon flying around in the chariot of the God. So that's a, a wonderful meaning, but I cannot agree with it. Because again, in my belief, and again, I believe in God, I'm a deep believer. In my belief, God does not need a vehicle in which to move around. So Ezekiel never saw God sitting on his flying chariots flying around because God has not the flying chariot. And Ezekiel describes the legs and the wheels and the noise. So a modern interpretation seems for me to make sense. All true, there are many controversies left, of course, contradictions left. We're going to continue with this discussion with David Halpern and Eric Von Daniken about the meaning of events described in the Bible, ancient astronauts, visitors from outer space, more to come. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> Thank you for listening to GCN. Be sure to visit GCNlive.com today. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. I'm here to tell you about GCNTelecare.com, a team of board-certified doctors assisting you 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. Within 15 minutes of registration, care your family can afford. Revolutionizing the healthcare industry, virtual consulting, providing diagnosis of non-emergency medical issues by phone or secure video on computer or smart mobile devices. GCNTelecare.com. Virtual care anywhere. Frustrated trying to get business capital? Want to take the slow process and rejection out of the equation? GCNLoans.com removes the slow, irritating approval process. Instead, get quick, simple funding. Powered by David Allen Capital, 80% of our pre-qualified clients are approved in days. Pre-qualify at GCNLoans.com and get your money this week. It's that easy. GCNLoans.com. That's GCNLoans.com. Hey folks, Tom D. for ParanormalDate.com. Are you looking for love in all the wrong places? Now you have a chance to change that by signing up free at ParanormalDate.com. This incredible dating site puts people of like minds together. People who are interested in the strange, the unusual, ghosts, zombies, UFOs, crop circles, and more. ParanormalDate.com was developed for you, people who seek a little more than the other dating services offer. You can join for free by going to ParanormalDate.com. And if you decide you like it and you want to connect with others, use the code GEORGE for a substantial discount. So many people want to share their experiences with the paranormal, the afterlife, the unusual. And this is the place to meet and share common interests with those of like minds. So sign up for free at ParanormalDate.com. That's ParanormalDate.com. Use the code word GEORGE and start meeting others. Get going now and connect with someone you like.
Does the current world crisis in North Korea or our domestic crisis right here in America concern you? Well, I know it concerns me. My friends over at Legacy Food Storage have solutions in the event there's the inevitable. What's the inevitable? Civil unrest, a run on your local grocery store. And here's my question to you. If this happens, how do you feed your children? How do you feed your grandchildren? Legacy Food Storage has the solutions. In fact, they can help you implement a simple plan to take care of your needs in the event of the inevitable. By calling them right now, I have authorized them to give you a special 20% discount at checkout by simply using GCN. Call 888-543-7345 or visit them at LegacyFoodStorage.com. That's 888-543-7345 or visiting them at LegacyFoodStorage.com. Make sure you use GCN at checkout for an incredible 20% discount. Don't be a victim. Take control of your life now. Message and data rates may apply. You don't follow the herd. You blaze your own trail. And you're as adventurous in the kitchen as you are in life. Whether it's paddleboard yoga or Peruvian steak, you're the first to try new things. So are we. We're Green Chef, the first USDA-certified organic meal kit delivery service. We offer delicious meal plans for seven different lifestyles. Paleo, gluten-free, keto, vegetarian, vegan, carnivore, and omnivore. Want to be the first of your friends to try Green Chef? Discover our exclusive introductory deal by texting the keyword FUN66 to 543543. We believe that cooking, just like life, should be all about experience and flavor. And by exploring dinner options with Green Chef, you'll try new recipes, techniques, and ingredients for bold, new restaurant-level flavors. It's like enjoying a new cooking class, but in your own home. To experience this culinary adventure, text now and discover our exclusive introductory deal. Text FUN66 to 543543. That's F-U-N-66 to 543543. Hi, it's Grant Cameron from PresidentialUFO.com. You're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. Chris O'Brien is not here today, and the reason is he's preparing to move, probably be present for a while when we do the episode with Stan Gordon, which is coming up on next week's show. So we'll continue with Eric Von Daniken. And David, perhaps you want to have a response to that. The thing I'm wondering about here is at what point do we interpret something in the Bible as a possible work, a fiction, just like you write fiction, I write fiction, and something that is meant to represent actual events? What's the line of demarcation here? I, th- I think that's a, that, that's a really, really good question. That does not necessarily mean that it does. That is to say that people can write fiction and try to pass it off as something that really happened, which cannot be excluded. Well, you know, soon as a science fiction writer of the deep past, thousands of years ago, let's call him Enoch or Ezekiel, whatever, when he writes scientific facts which could not have been known at his time, then he's, it's not science fiction. In the case, the so-called angels or the highest up there explains to Enoch not only about the moon and the light where the, the, the moon has his light from, he explains him also the calendar. He says, you see all these little lights up there, they are all suns, like your sun here. And around these suns, there are planets uh, surrounding. He explains them the calendar of the earth, including leak hours not leak days as we have it every four years. So this is scientific information which the writer at some thousands of years could not have known in his time. It was all before the Great Flood. Now, when I read the information come from? Now, when I read the Book of Enoch, it did not seem to me to have any scientific information that we would recognize as such. That Oh, yes. Well, it has to... In the oh. so-called astronomical chapter, you find a lot of it. Well, if you can tell me, I have a copy of it on my shelf. Let's Shall we look it up? Again, Enoch is just one example. You have to see, to compare other examples with other writers some thousands of years ago from other cultures. For example, from India. There you have the Mahabharata. And in the fifth book of the Mahabharata, the Mausala Purva, there is something like Enoch. 
The man is called Arjuna. He was taken up to the sky. And he comes again like, you know, to a gigantic thing. He does not call it spaceship. The translations call it heaven. And it happened something similar. Like to Enoch, he's, he's in, in, uh, instructed in astronomy and several belongings. Okay, I have the book of Enoch open now to chapter 72. Now here's what I'm reading. The sun yes. is a luminary whose egress is an opening of heaven, which is located in the direction of the east, and whose ingress is another opening of heaven located in the west. I saw six openings through which the sun rises and six openings through which it sets. The moon also rises and sets through the same openings, and they are guided by the stars together with those whom they lead. They are six in the east and six in the west heaven. There are many windows, both to the left and the right of these openings. First, there goes out the great light whose name is the sun. Its roundness is like the roundness of the sky, and it is totally filled with light and heat. The chariot on which it ascends is driven by the blowing wind. The sun sets in the sky in the west and returns by the northeast in order to go to the east, and so forth. I won't keep reading this, but isn't it perfectly clear that the man or woman who is writing this has no knowledge of astronomy as we conceive it? That indeed well, he or she is repeating the what we now know to be the false astronomy of antiquity? You see, the book of Enoch has been translated many, many times, like, by the way, most of the old book, and always some other writers have understood nothing. They could not understand what Enoch was saying. So it was them who added all kinds of things about the doors, where the sun goes into the doors. Maybe today we would translate it and say the different seasons. There are seasons in, in winter, in spring, etc. It's all a question of how these translators looked at it and what they understood some hundreds of, a few, maybe even thousands of years ago. But there are still facts in the book of Enoch. Like, for example, the moon has its light from the sun, etc. So I, I still see there is this, an original source, and this original source written in the first person has been mixed during the last uh, thousands of years. Yeah, I think Aristotle knew that too. I mean, that the ancient Greeks knew that the world was round. They were able to measure it, to measure its diameter. So I don't see in the text that you're referring to any scientific knowledge that cannot be perfectly well explained by its time. And when you start bringing in translators and people getting later transmitters getting it messed up, I think you are introducing, you are trying to save your system by making arbitrary assumptions. But then you have another problem. If you look, it's just a science fiction story. Who was the writer? Why? What for? Why has it become a holy book? The book of Enoch should be one of the holy books. Why is Enoch a prophet among the Jewish community, etc.? These are very good questions. And there is no reason why they can't be approached without bringing in extraterrestrials. One thing, one thing you did, very, with, I, which I approve of very strongly in Chariots of the Gods, is you bring out how much mystery there is in antiquity. There is a lot we don't know, a lot we don't understand. And our image of what we think we know is our way of drawing connections among the dots, the bits of data, which for antiquity are quite sparse, and connecting those dots. So I'm glad you did that. I'm glad you opened people's eyes to the uncertainties of the past. But when you, I am bound to say that the solution that you offer the picture that you draw of extraterrestrials in intervening in human life does not seem to me to work. Read, I, I invite anyone who's listening to this 
to read the book of Ezekiel straight through from chapter 1 to chapter 48 and see if that really sounds like extra extraterrestrials talking to human beings. I don't think it will work at all. Let me ask you a question here before we go on. Let me ask you a question here, David, just to get your feelings about this. Do you think there's any evidence at all that we were visited in ancient times by extraterrestrials? None at all. In my opinion, but to read Ezekiel and to say these are extraterrestrials is every bit as much a conventionalization, a reduction of something truly mysterious to what we think of as conventional terms, every bit as much as saying that these are visions of God. You hear what I'm saying? Both to say it's a visions of the biblical God and to say it's visions of spacecraft are both conventional reductions of something that is beyond reduction. We'll get into more of this in just a moment. Yes. Let me remind you, we have a second radio show called After the Paracast that you can hear if you subscribe to the Paracast Plus. We also give you a version of this show free of the network ads. It's a terrific package. To learn more about how you can subscribe, go to plus.theparacast.com. That's plus.theparacast.com. Chris O'Brien's The Process of Moving. We have Eric Von Daniken, author of Chariots of the Gods and many other books. We have David Halpern. And we'll continue our discussion. You're in. The Paracast. Thank you for listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. Do you need a website? Well, you can get a great deal on hosting services with Namecheap's legendary coupon code. They're offering substantial hosting discounts on shared hosting, business hosting, VPS hosting, reseller hosting, and even dedicated servers. Namecheap is preferred by millions. It's backed by a money-back guarantee. Use the coupon code LEGENDARY to cash in on the special deal at Namecheap.com, Namecheap.com. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at Rockoids.com. That's Rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. Hawaii was a wake-up call. Don't be caught without a disaster shelter. Atlas makes an all-disaster shelter that will protect your family from fallout, tornadoes, and hurricanes for only $99.99. That also includes the NBC air filtration system, solid steel construction with an airtight bulletproof door. That's right. For $99.99 and up, call 1-855-4-BUNKER or go to IWantThatShelter.com. Atlas Survival Shelters, the world leader in fallout shelters. Hunters, anglers, campers, and survivalists. Get back to nature. Expand your horizons with the highest quality, most versatile, unique slingshots and sling bows on the market at slingbow.com. Slingbow products are compact and models start from just $17.98. They're perfect for your bug out bag or storing in your vehicle. Give yourself and your loved ones the excitement and tradition of Slingbow, a new frontier in archery and truly modern twist on this primitive survival tool. Feel the thrill only at slingbow.com. Fully cooked, ready-to-eat bacon. I'm talking thick, meaty, center-cut, presidential bacon. Savory and delicious. I buy some, I use some, I store some. Awesome. No refrigeration needed with a 10-year shelf life. NASA Pack technology. Bacon. Fully cooked, fully hydrated, ready-to-eat right from the pack bacon. Or warm and served. Life-saving, ready-to-eat bacon. 10-year shelf life bacon. Ships free at FullyCookedBacon.com. FullyCookedBacon.com. Are you happy washing your hands with harsh chemicals? Are you happy doing laundry with detergents? Are you happy paying high prices? Find your happiness with Pure Soap. These all-natural, earth-friendly Pure Soaps are the very best you've ever used. Buy in bulk. 
Get a 12, 36, or 48-month supply. Or get items individually and still save big. You're getting soap products twice as good as what you're using now. Earth-friendly and natural soaps. Your family deserves the best. Happiness is 5starsoap.com. Why not put your money up the drain for a change? See them at 5starsoap.com or call 1-800-340-7091 for a catalog. Cal Bend Soap Company can save you thousands of dollars and give you good old-fashioned real soaps that are triple concentrated. Soaps made from vegetable and coconut oils. See their full selection of soaps at 5starsoap.com. That's F-I-V-E starsoap.com. Or call 1-800-340-7091 for a catalog. Water is the single most important thing your body needs, so you want to be sure it's the best for you and your family. Since 2005, thousands have depended on Berkey Purified Water. The Berkey Guy provides the lowest priced filtration systems in every size. For incredibly delicious water now and in an emergency, get to GoBerkey.com or call 877-886-3653. 877-886-3653. GoBerkey.com. Hi, this is James Fox from Chasing UFOs. You're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. Eric Von Danigan making his first appearance yes. on the Paracast. I assume at this point, having heard David Halperin's response, you have some more to say. Go ahead, please. Of course, of course. Uh, I have just a, a new book on the American market. It's called The Gods Never Left Us. And there... In the last chapter, I compare at least 30 different mythologies, mythologies which are all in prehistory times, mythologies of people with, where no one has an information from the other. For example, in the South Sea, in the South Pacific, there are, are cultures existing and they have their myths and traditions. And it is funny, some of their myths are similar to the one, for example, in the, in the rest of the world. Let's call it in Finland or the old German myths or the Greek myths. But all of these uh, communities had no contact in them. Why did they all come to the same idea? That in the beginning there was a chaos. Out of the chaos, some gods descended. The gods created humans according to their own image. And this is not one myth. This is all over the world. I just made this comparison in my new book. So I understand the position of the believing people. And we have really one situation. You see, on this planet, we have two points to look at these old things. We have a religious point. According to the religious point, it is God, and God created everything. There's a crown of creation. He made finally us. But then we have a scientific point. The science says it's all evolution, but we are the top of evolution. Now, in both versions, if we look at it at the religious point, the crown of creation, or scientific, the top of evolution. In both cases, we look at ourselves as the greatest. Something like us does not exist. And I think this view is wrong. In my view, although I cannot prove it, in my view, the universe is full of life, and we have been influenced by extraterrestrials. Again, I would say, try reading the book of Ezekiel from beginning to end. And run the extraterrestrial theory on that. I think you're going to find a lot of problems with it. Ezekiel go, I, Ezekiel is taken into the Jerusalem temple. He, uh, yeah. he He's shown abominations there. What are the abominations? Uh, worshipping the sun. The women weeping for Tammuz. Why should extraterrestrials care about these things? In the book of Ezekiel, there are incredible stories which obviously have nothing to do with the original Ezekiel. The original Ezekiel is like a skeleton. When he describes the flying chariot, he describes, as I said before, the wheel and the noises, etc. This is the skeleton. And later on, because people could not understand what Ezekiel was saying, they added all kinds of things. I read more than 89 uh, uh, theologists who had different opinions about Ezekiel. Some of the 100 uh, theologians say Ezekiel was an epileptic. He didn't have a vision. It's all just imagination. 
all kinds of versions are there. But Ezekiel is describing a flying chariot. He describes the noise. He compares the noise with the thundering of a waterfall, etc. So he's not only seeing something like a vision, he's hearing some. But then I have to accept that you said there is a lot of thing in Ezekiel which definitely have nothing to do with extraterrestrials. And therefore, your hypothesis requires you to make all sorts of arbitrary distinctions and throw out whatever does not suit it. And that does not seem like a very successful hypothesis. Well, it's always to find how you look at it and what you know. You can look at it in a, in a, in a, in a way of believer. And then what is the result? You believe that Ezekiel had seen the Lord in his flying chariot. And though that what is written there in the Ezekiel story, you believe it has to do with God. Well, what sort of God is that? Or else you can say that what you are reading in Ezekiel is the projection of a man, part of a small nation that has gotten very badly banged up in the great power struggles of the time, who has endured the trauma of being driven into exile, and who has projected on the basis of his own traumas a being that is the cause, the explanation, and the possible solution of them. This is a very secular approach to the Bible, but not one, therefore, to be rejected necessarily. Well, of course, I respect the answer of the believers, but I have a different opinion. I'm a seeker for God, for the real God. I never understood God, although I pray to God every evening. But that, what I find in the old books about God, cannot be God, what I think is God. God would use a vehicle. God would come down on the mountain with smoke and fire and loud noise, etc. I, I don't believe this sort of God. But if so I'm I... looking... Sorry? Yes, so I'm looking for other possible answers. And a modern point of view is quite a possible answer soon as you compare it with other writings around the world. If you look it only at the Bible, like Ezekiel or maybe like Enoch, then it's definitely not enough. Then I have to agree what you suggest here. I, I, I think that you very much underrate the value, the, the capacity of the human imagination. Why imagine chariots in the sky? Well, there is at least one possible answer to that, that we, I know, if I'm in living in the ancient world, whether in, uh, in Palestine or in India, that, that, that the, king is, the king has his army of chariots, his force of chariots, who, who, who destroy his enemies and protect him. Well, why not assume that God is a king in heaven who has flying chariots? We know that well, at, if we, if we look up at the sky, we see a, a fiery flying chariot. It's called the sun. Why not project from these realities into a fantasy that turns See, up similar in many different, the different cultures because it has similar roots? Well, in the old Indian texts, in the Mausala Purva, which is the fifth book of the Mahabharata, they clearly make differences between uh, chariots which can fly, chariots which cannot fly, some of them have wheels, other of them have never wheels, chariots which surround the earth, chariots who even go to the moon. They make these differences, and they know what it was. It was not just only a, a, a chariot like a normal wagon, which was uh, a horse were there, etc. There are these differences. And why does that prove that, the, the, that they describe realities? Why? cannot the human imagination make those distinctions? Well, you can never exclude it, except when you have information which were not reasonable at that time. As I said, some astronomical information. You mentioned the book of Enoch before. Now, it's just a chapter you said about the, the planets with all these stars, which can be completely misunderstood. On the other hand, 
one of the so-called teachers of heaven says to Enoch, look out of the window. You see this little light. You humans call it moon. The moon has no light by itself. It is, receives the light from the sun. So this is an information which could not have known by some scientific writer some thousand of years ago. Are you quite sure At least my, my, my is Aristotle already knew it? Huh? My impression is that the Greeks already knew that. Well, the Greek were brilliant. We know, I, I know Greek tradition. And as you, as you said before, the Greek know about the, the round earth and a lot of things. But the Greek also, they flying machines. God Apollo came down to, to Delphi in a flying chariot. God Apollo flies to the land of the Hyperborean in a flying chariot. In some of the Greek myths, myths God comes out of the sea and goes into the sky. So it's all fantastic stories. Or the god Zeus in the Greek mythology, he has constructed some sort of robot. This robot was called Talos. Talos was surrounding every day the island of Malta. And whenever someone wants to visit Malta, who was not accepted there. So Talos, the robot, shot the enemy or whatever was to visit them down. He could not reach Malta. So it's mythology, of course. But how did they invent a sort of, of robot who surrounds the island of Malta and, and avoids that enemies can come to the island? Let's That's continue it. this discussion in a moment. Fascinating debate with Eric Von Danigan and David Halperin on ancient astronauts. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> Thank you for listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. Attack of the Rockoids has been well received by critics and readers alike. It's a thrill a minute story you'll never forget. A former U.S. military intelligence officer is haunted by intense dreams about a beautiful woman pleading for his help after a terrible battle in outer space. But the dreams turn out to be true and thrust him into a telepathic love affair with a woman whose faraway planet is intent on destroying the Earth. And now the gripping tale continues in The Coming of the Protectors. It's the second book of the Rockoids trilogy, a galaxy-spanning adventure that pits our hapless heroes against powerful, fanatical enemies that threaten the lives of freedom-loving beings everywhere. Attack of the Rockoids and The Coming of the Protectors. Classic science fiction at its best. Available now. For more details, visit rockoids.com. That's R O C K O I D S.com. You've been hearing Dr. Wallach talking about 90 essential nutrients, keeping the body healthy. GCNteam.com now has Beyond Tangy Tangerine tablets. 60 plant-derived minerals, 16 vitamins, 12 amino acids, packed in a powerful tablet. But that's not it. 160,000 auric points, a knockout punch to free radicals. Call 877-878-4203 or go to GCNteam.com. That's 877-878-4203. It's a no-brainer. A Big Berkey water filter is the one you need, period. You need a water filter that removes chlorine, fluoride, pharmaceuticals, BPA, and other endocrine disruptors, pesticides, bacteria, viruses, and much more, right? And does it all at only two cents per gallon. Get the original, most trusted name in gravity water filtration, Big Berkey. And now GCN listeners receive 5% off ceramic filter systems using code GCN. Call or click 1-877-99-BERKEY or BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com. That's 1-877-99-BERKEY. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. We continue with Eric Von Daniken and David Halperin, and this is a fascinating discussion going back and forth into myths and legends, biblical texts, trying to see what really happened. Let's point out something, too. When we mention fiction writing, people who write science fiction, for example, we imagine what things will be like decades, hundreds, thousands of years from now, how society will change, what kind of 
technology will exist. I would certainly think that any intelligent people, even those who aren't as sophisticated as we are with technology, could imagine in their own way what the future might bring. David? What is the question here? I just want your comment about that. The point you know, being here that if someone's writing a work of fiction, regardless of what era they live in, they can certainly imagine what the future might be like or things that aren't invented what they may be like. Yeah, I think there are limits to how much they can get beyond their own culture and the realities of that culture. So I think we have to try to ask, how could these myths have been reflections of what was people's earthly reality? Eric talks about giants in Chariots of the Gods, that he he writes on one point that giants haunt the pages of almost all ancient books, so they must have existed. I'm not sure if I would agree they haunt the pages of almost all ancient books, but I, I certainly think it's a common theme. But suppose I were to say that giants are part of our of our reality. How so? Because we have memory traces of when we were very small, we were surrounded by giants who came to attend to us, fed us, protected us, changed our diapers. And of course, they were giants only by comparison to our smallness. But if you think about it, any giant is only a giant by comparison to something else. Why would this not be a perfectly satisfactory explanation of why people tend to believe in giants? Well, if you accept this, then we, at the same time, we say that the Bible is, is telling us nonsense. Because in the Bible, they say that they created giants. So they tell us nonsense in the Bible. Or, for example, it, again, in the fifth book of the, of the Mahabharata, the Mausala Purva, they say then on the firmament, and clearly they say firmament, not sky, not heaven, firmament, three cities came together. They say it because Arjuna was brought up there. And this text was translated in the year 1988 by Professor Dr. Chandra Roy. And at that time, in 1988, something like spaceships or even mother spaceships did not exist. And he translates, then the three cities came together in the firmament. So what science fiction is this? Really fantastic. I think in what you said a little bit earlier, we may be moving toward the heart of the dispute, which is, is myth the same thing as nonsense? I would submit no, to no, you no. it's not. No, in my eyes, myth is not nonsense. Myth contains a lot of imagination and fantasy and stories which uh, could be nonsense. But myth always has more. Something happened. And then later, after centuries or even thousands of years, the humans could not understand what it was. And they added all kinds of fantasy to make it explainable for them. Is that the but only something way? Something in core was true. Is that the only way myth can be said to be other than nonsense? Does it have to be in its core a description? A, an accurate description of something in reality. Now, my uh, uh, m the suggestion I've made about giants, if we, if we believe in giants, we are remembering something that was absolutely true from our earliest days, but projecting it into the earliest days of the human race and imagining that the giants are not just giants by comparison with our tiny infantness, but giants compared to a regular human being. Does it well, make I, it nonsense to say that we have this memory trace of the real giants of our past? Well, this is certainly an, 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 an answer which I could, can understand, but it's not my opinion. It's not only the Bible who speaks about giants were created. 
It's many, many other traditions who speak about giants. They were war, the humans against some giants. In Greek mythology, they are different uh, fights what giants fight against humans and so on. Now, it could be all imagination, but then all these stories at the same time are lies. And, and that's a, they are, really have a problem. They were all liars, just science, science fiction authors. You know, the first people who learned to write in Sumerian cuneiform, for example, only a few people were able to write. And writing was a high, something very high knowledge. Now, I cannot understand why these first writers stopped to write science fictions. And their priests, high priests or rulers or kings would not tell them, what a rubbish are you writing here? That's not reality. Now, for example, in the Gilgamesh epic, in the beginning, and this is from Sumerian writing, some of the older, they say that the gods created a being, Gilgamesh, he was partly human and partly God. So he was a mixed creature. Now, it was a lie. The first writers in uniform start with lies. Yeah, I think we're, you're forcing us, you're forcing me to c- confront the question of truth versus lying, right? Yeah. And I think that's important. What do I, when I sit down and write a story, write a, a document in the name of Enoch, what do I think I am doing? And I don't know. I think this is a very serious psy- psychological problem. Yes, but if you would, would sit down and write a story in the, in the name of Enoch, in the I form, in the first person, you do as if you would be Enoch. You write as if it would be it, Enoch. Then you are simply a liar. Well, you know what, I'm here... This is something that happens in fiction now, and I don't know if there's an ancient equivalent, that you have a series of stories and you have a unified name. And that name, you get different writers who are hacks or hired to write under that name. And, for example, we have the pulp novels featuring The Shadow that were written under one name, but several different authors wrote those stories. So couldn't we think here that stories written 2,000 years ago as part of a series of stories, they could have brought in different people to write those stories? What difference would it make? Well, you cannot exclude this. But just imagine some thousands of years ago, you have different people. You have to unite them to write a story. Like today, science fiction novelists write together. But we are speaking of an episode which is thousands of years back. There were only a few writers, and they start to write science fiction stories. I don't believe a word of it. Yeah, the question becomes, what do ancient storytellers, like Homer, like the author of the Epic of Gilgamesh, what is their consciousness of what they're doing? I mean, I would assume you are not going to say, that all the things that happen in Homer's Odyssey, like uh, the giant Polyphemus eating uh, Odysseus's companions, I assume you're not going to say that all of those stories really happened as historical events. So it's- No, of course not. Uh, Okay, guys, we're gonna break here and we'll continue with our discussion in just a few moments with David and Eric. You're in. The Paracast. Neighbors, we've made such a deal with HelloFresh, and it means that everyone listening to this show can receive $30 off your first week of deliveries when you go to HelloFresh.com and use the offer code PARACAST30. You know, with HelloFresh, you can choose the delivery day that works best for you. They've got a wide variety of chef-curated recipes that change weekly. And can you imagine me cooking Japanese panko chicken. It makes me feel like I'm a chef. It means also that you could actually get your meal cooked in 30 minutes. For busy people, this is perfect. The simple recipes include step-by-step instructions so even I can figure it out. 
Go to HelloFresh.com, use the offer code PARACAST30 to get $30 off your first week of deliveries. HelloFresh.com. Over the last four years, three of the biggest online precious metals dealers have gone bankrupt and their owners put in prison due to theft and fraud. Having previously purchased precious metals, can you be sure you purchased the right product? Did you receive proper advice? Or were you stung by one of these companies? Miles Franklin has been in business for 29 years without receiving any material customer or regulatory complaints ever. Maintaining an A-plus Better Business Bureau rating and residing in Minnesota, the only state in America that regulates the precious metals industry, making doing business in precious metals with Miles Franklin the safest choice, bar none. Call us at 866-485-4346 and let us review your portfolio at no commitment whatsoever. Again, that's 866-485-4346. Get the peace of mind you deserve in working with a precious metals company with a reputation like Miles Franklin. Again, that's 866-485-4346. Miles Franklin Precious Metals, the name you can trust. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. I'm here to tell you about GCNTelecare.com, a team of board-certified doctors assisting you 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. Within 15 minutes of registration, care your family can afford. Revolutionizing the healthcare industry, virtual consulting, providing diagnosis of non-emergency medical issues by phone or secure video on computer or smart mobile devices. GCNTelecare.com, virtual care anywhere. Heart disease is on the rise. Clogged arteries, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol levels may not be fully detected by you, but the symptoms are there. Loss of energy, blood sugar spikes and drops, poor circulation, and irregular heartbeat are just a few of these that can alert you that something is wrong. Hear how heart and body extract is making a difference in thousands of people's lives across America. My blood pressure has normalized. My diabetes has totally improved. Everyone is telling me now how much healthier I look, and I'm telling everyone how much healthier I feel. I recommend heart and body extract to everyone. Anybody over 40 in the North American continent should be using this product as a preventative to keep their cardiovascular system healthy. Order your two-month supply today by calling 866-295-5305. That's 866-295-5305. Or order online, hbextract.com. Heart and body extract, 866-295-5305. Or hbextract.com. Hunters, anglers, campers, and survivalists. Get back to nature. Expand your horizons with the highest quality, most versatile, unique slingshots and sling bows on the market at slingbow.com. Slingbow products are compact and models start from just $17.98. They're perfect for your bug out bag or storing in your vehicle. Give yourself and your loved ones the excitement and tradition of Slingbow, a new frontier in archery and truly modern twist on this primitive survival tool. Feel the thrill only at slingbow.com. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Eric Von Daniken has to go shortly, but we have a lot to talk about with David Halperin. So let's continue with that. Eric? Yes. Go ahead, please. Any further comments? As you know, I, I have published so far 40 books. And in these 40 books, I try to bring the case forward that our planet was visited by beings, extraterrestrial beings, some thousands and thousands of years ago. And I, of course, know we, we can never prove this today completely in a scientific manner. We make assumptions because of many texts which different people have written around the world some thousands of years ago. Now, I accept the possibility that a lot of it was fantasy, was just science fiction. But in the beginning of writing, the writers were serious people, and I don't think that they started to write with with science fiction story. You see, we have, for example, a Gilgamesh epic. And in the Gilgamesh epic, they also describe about the Great Flood, which later is part of the Bible when Noah constructed the ship. Now, for example, in uh, South America, in today's Colombia, is a tribe called the Kogi. I visited the Kogi. They have wonderful mythology, and they bring the same story as in the Bible, as in the Gilgamesh epic, about the great flood. 
Now in South America, today's Colombia, they had no contact with Far East. How did they come to the same story? They had the same teacher. And both, by the way, the Gilgamesh epic and the ones from South America, from Colombia, the Kogi, they say that after the great flood, the, God, the gods descended again from the sky. Or in the old Egyptian pyramid texts, you have so many uh, assumptions and connections with the stairways to heaven, going up to heaven. The Pharaoh wishes to go to the next world. Now, of course, I know our today's scientific answer. They feel it was just imagination. They had the wish to dream that a life after that, they could go there to other worlds and visit it. I understand this, but I do not agree because the descriptions sometimes are too precise in these old texts. And I rather prefer a modern point of view. Well, don't you think, though, and I think the logic here that might come up is that you're looking for a theory that can never be proven unless we can find some relic of hardware from the past. Yes. We're just making assumptions. We don't know what might have happened. This doesn't mean that we have never been visited by extraterrestrials. It doesn't mean there's no UFO mystery today where people see strange things that many will theorize are here from other worlds. Nor does it mean that there isn't a possibility that those visitations have happened for thousands of years and that there might have been interactions. The key here is what do we do 2,000 years later except make a lot of elaborate guesses on texts that have been revised over and over again over the centuries? Where do we go from here, Eric? Well, we have to try to look at some of these texts with modern eyes. We have to change the spirit of time. We all are believers in God, and I mean real, true believers in God. And then we find in the old text some stories which you cannot assume or bring in connection with the real God. It would discredit the real God in a fiery chariot flying around with smoke and fire. So we have to look for new possible explanations to change the spirit of time. And I fully agree with you. Just because of old traditions, old books, we will never be able to finally prove that extraterrestrials were here some thousands of years ago. We make up assumptions, correct. But one day, we probably will find an extraterrestrial object. Maybe we have already an extraterrestrial object, or even many of them. But because of religion, we cannot go close. Just to mention the Ark of the Governor. Of the old Bible, the Ark of the Covenant is an object which has come from God and the inside of it. Now, today, we know that the rest of the Ark of the Covenant is in the so-called Church of the Holy Virgin Mary in Aksum. Aksum is a city in Ethiopia. That's a long story. I cannot explain it now, how from Jerusalem it went to Ethiopia. Now, the today's Pope of the Orthodox Church said in an interview two years ago in, to a German newspaper that he saw the Ark of the Government and it is not human. So maybe we have an object on Earth or many objects of Earth, but we don't know them except a few people. We only have a few minutes left before Eric leaves us, David, so we'll continue after that. But do you have a quick reaction? I don't think anything beyond what I've already said, Gene. In a way, I feel a bit awkward continuing the conversation after Eric goes because I may make statements that he would want to respond to and will not have the opportunity. I think there are other issues we can talk about without doing that. Fair enough? Yeah, that I would like to say, Eric, that there are some things I agree with in what you've done and some things I disagree with. What I like is the way you have underscored the many things we do not know about antiquity. It becomes too easy to think everything is all neatly packaged and cut and dried. I know as well as anybody that antiquity is full of mysteries. But in all truth, I do not think your extraterrestrial hypothesis is a viable way to approach them. We have to look for other ways. I, I fully understand your position. But I don't have the same 
opinion as you have, because I have different knowledge. We both have different knowledge. We have different edu educations, etc. I know that we have been visited, and I know it from the many old traditions worldwide. And of course, by the way, in the introduction of this uh, discussion, uh, it was said that you are a man who has to... I think we lost Eric. Eric, you there? Okay, now today, so-called so reasonable people do not believe in UFOs. All through, there is a lot of evidence for UFOs. So what do we do? One part of mankind seems to be reasonable. UFO is nonsense. The other part are also reasonable, but they are called the idiots, the stupids, the believers in UFOs. But UFOs do exist. I have a similar, similar opinion in, concerning the past. I believe, because of my information, that we were visited by beings from outer space. Now, many reasonable persons say, this is nonsense. And I fully understand their position. But we don't have the same knowledge at the same time. In our next segment with David Halpern, we'll discuss more about his opinions and focus more on what he thinks about the UFO mystery, about UFO reality, and what he thinks may be the cause of the phenomenon. I think that's a good place to stop right now. Eric Von Daniken, do you have a website if people want to check out what you do ongoing? Yes, well, uh, just go on Eric Von Daniken. Then you find my, my homepage and whatever. Thank you, Eric Von Daniken. <laughs> Hopefully we can have you back in the future for a longer time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ciao. David Halperin will continue. You're in. The Paracast. are listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. Water is the single most important thing your body needs, so you want to be sure it's the best for you and your family. Since 2005, thousands have depended on Berkey Purified Water. The Berkey Guy provides the lowest priced filtration systems in every size. For incredibly delicious water now and in an emergency, Get to GoBerkey.com or call 877-886-3653, 877-886-3653, GoBerkey.com. This is Dan Pilla. Do you owe the IRS money you can't pay? Are tax debts crippling you? I've defended people from the IRS for over 30 years. I've helped thousands and I can help you too. I wrote the book on IRS settlement and I'm telling you, there's no such thing as a hopeless case. Call 800-34-NO-TAX to finally get free of IRS debt. With the IRS's new programs, there's never been a better time to solve your problem. Call 800-34-NO-TAX. That's 800-34-NO-TAX or my website, danpilla.com. Warning. If you're drowning in debt you can't afford, do not let the credit card companies trick you into thinking that you have to pay it all back because you don't. What the credit card companies don't want you to know is that there's actually a way to get debt-free without paying off your entire debt or going bankrupt. If you have $5,000 or more in credit card debt, you now have the right to let us settle that debt for a fraction of what you owe. For free information, call Credit Associates now. 1-800-959-5759. We'll even show you how much money you could save. If you can't afford to pay off all your debt, do not let the credit card companies trick you into thinking that you have to. Call Credit Associates now for free information on how to get debt-free faster than you ever thought possible without debt consolidation or bankruptcy. We depend on your success and offer a guarantee, so there's no risk. For free information, call now. 1-800-959-5759. That's 1-800-959-5759. 1-800-959-5759. Are you still looking for that one iodine that you can really trust? A medical doctor-endorsed product that is backed by honest research and true integrative science. Then search no further. Go to Nutramedical.com for Dr. Bill Deagle's Nutriodine, proven time and time again to be the very best iodine available for you. Nutriodine is the only Tesla-activated monatomic plasma iodine in the world. It optimizes mitochondrial function and generation of new mitochondria from totally neutral 
neutralizing the venom from a desert recluse spider bite in Southern California to eliminating malaria parasites reported by medical missionaries in Central India. Dr. Bill's Nutriodine is simply the most powerful healing formula there is. Nutriodine clears the body of all known pathogens, restores it to an alkaline state, and even promotes stem cell regeneration. Order Dr. Bill's Nutriodine today at 888 212 8871 or visit us online at Nutramedical.com. People search the internet for everything, including you. With a few clicks, information from your past can be quickly discovered. From business deals gone wrong to misleading reviews, negative articles, and unflattering images. Studies show 78% of people search for someone online before doing business with them. Will they find the real you? With ReputationDefender.com, you can establish a positive internet presence. ReputationDefender.com pioneered the field with over a decade of experience, serving thousands of successful individuals and businesses. We use patented, award-winning systems to boost positive content and suppress negative material. Don't let the internet define you. Take control of your reputation today with ReputationDefender.com. For your quick, free reputation analysis, call 800-831-0771. That's 800-831-0771, 800-831-0771, or visit reputationdefender.com. Hi, this is Don Ecker, and you are tuned in to the Paracast. Let me tell you what, you're going to hear stuff here that you probably won't hear anywhere else. Hear that, George Snorri? So David Halpern continues, and for the first half of the PowerCast, we had Eric Von Daniken, and they restricted us to half the show because they have him under a very tight leash to the number of things he could do, but we hope to have him back for more time in the future. This has turned out to be a real fascinating debate with David Halpern. I think it would be nice for our listeners now to know more about you and how you became so knowledgeable about biblical history. Could you kind of give us a bit of your background, David? Uh, yeah, I began reading the Bible when I was 12 and became fascinated with it and kept on reading it and kept on studying it. At about the same time, I became fascinated by UFOs and was like Eugene and like many of us in those days, a teen ufologist. I gave up ufology when I went to college. I began to learn ancient languages, pursued my knowledge of the Bible, but found I kept coming back to UFO-related topics, like the vision in the first chapter of Ezekiel, and traditions like the one Eric referred to, about the Enoch's ascension to heaven and stories of otherworldly journeys and heavenly ascents, which I came to realize after a while were my own ufology in a more conventionally respectable guise. My project now is to understand not only what UFOs meant to me 50-some years ago, but what they mean to all of us and how we can stake out a third position to say they are neither real vehicles flying around the sky, nor are they nonsense. When we look at theories like ancient astronauts, and obviously Eric Von Daniken was one of the later people to do that. We had Bryn Zilip or Trench, we had Desmond Leslie and others, where did people decide to get this kind of connection? Was it because they're reaching into UFO history saying, well, if we're being visited now by UFOs, how far back does it go? Is that what led them to theorize about ancient astronauts? I don't know. And it's a really, really, really good question. I don't know if you're familiar, Gene, and I can, can turn on the... Uh... I'm, I'm reaching now for the for the actual document. If I turn on the camera, I can show it to you. That I'm holding up here. Can you see it? It's an article called "The Four Faced Visitors of Ezekiel." You just have to move it to what my left would be. There, I see it. I see it now. It's 
authored by Orton? Arthur Orton. It was published in Analog Science Fact Fiction in March of 1961. It is, in my opinion, one of the finest things ever written in the ancient astronaut genre by a man who, as far as I know, had no interest in UFOs. He was involved in the space program, and he gave the first chapter of the Book of Ezekiel an extremely careful reading, concluding that what Ezekiel was describing was the visit of human-like extraterrestrials wearing backpack helicopters. Now, I don't agree with his conclusions. And I think he he brings out what is the basic flaw of this approach. But I must say I have the most immense respect for the care and respect with which he treated the Book of Ezekiel. And he's somebody come from completely outside the UFO tradition. So the question you pose as to the, let's call it the genealogy of the whole idea of ancient astronauts, I think is a really good one. Well, it's certainly a viable thing to theorize about, but I think the same problem I see here and certainly what Eric Von Daniken says, and we're not asking him or expecting him to respond since he's not here. And that is in general, looking at this in general, we have these ancient documents and we could reach and make them in many ways express anything we want, really. There's a wide range of interpretations And I suspect, in large part, and we're not criticizing any particular religion here, a lot of these texts have been manipulated over the centuries for political reasons, as much as anything else. Yeah, manipulated in the sense of being used for political reasons. Sure. Uh, Yeah, because I think that there's a limit to how they've been changed. A, A lot of people work on the assumption that there's been so many errors in copying, so much much insertion in these texts, so much mistranslation, that we really can't know what they originally said. I think this is a little bit too skeptical. I think we have, I mean, certainly for the book of Ezekiel, we have a pretty good sense of what that book originally said. Uh, There seems there seems to be very little question that it, that at least the bulk of it was written by the person it claims to be written by. You know, there there probably are some later insertions in it. So I wouldn't want to go too far in saying, uh, in talking about our uncertainties with these texts. Obviously, there's no way ever to get the full version unless we can travel back through time. Yeah, and there's no way to see what really happened. And that's something we need to keep very clearly in mind. Is there any way at all to be able to focus more on the original meaning? Because that has to be what's closest to the truth. Yeah, I mean, we can try, say, to put the book of Ezekiel in its ancient context. Let me let me hold something else up if I can, if I can grab... And I'll turn the camera on again. Okay, he's going to show me something which will I describe. Of course, we don't have the ability to present a video version of this show, although this might be the one time we could possibly do it, or maybe we can have David back to do that. Okay, what are you showing? I think it's better if you move it farther away from the camera because I can see it better. Yeah, even farther. Even farther, right. And now let me see the other page. That looks like a coin or something, right? It is a coin. Right. It's from Gaza in the 6th century BCE, which is to say a little bit later than Ezekiel. And it shows a bearded, apparently a god, sitting on a wheeled throne. And the three there are three Hebrew letters in the ancient Hebrew script, the letters yod Hey vav which in English would be Y-H-V, and these are the 
first three letters of the sacred name of God, Yahweh, uh, so that this does seem to be a picture of the biblical God, Yahweh. And he's sitting on a throne with, you see, very prominent wheels. Let's see, do, do, do you still want to look at this, or can I put this down? No, you could put it down now. Yeah. So are we seeing something? Actually, I said 6th century. It's I see it's 5th century. Is this winged chariot, the chariot has wings as well as wheels, is this winged chariot the thing that Ezekiel describes in the in the first chapter of his book? And... I think there has to be some connection, and yet it's not quite identical. I mean, we can see one wheel, and presumably there's a second wheel at the other end of the axle. An ancient chariot had two wheels. Let me break it here. We'll describe the chariot and what that might mean in our next segment with David Halperin. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> Thank you for listening to GCN. Be sure to visit GCNlive.com today. Do you need a website? Well, you can get a great deal on hosting services with Namecheap's legendary coupon code. They're offering substantial hosting discounts on shared hosting, business hosting, VPS hosting, reseller hosting, and even dedicated servers. Namecheap is preferred by millions. It's backed by a money-back guarantee. Use the coupon code LEGENDARY to cash in on the special deal at Namecheap.com, Namecheap.com. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream, a dream that turns out to be a nightmare because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at Rockoids.com. That's Rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. Hear that? That's the sound of a house being trashed while a gang of thieves ransack the place. And what they don't steal will be destroyed. This year, resolve not to be the next victim of a break-in. Go to faketv.com and discover a device that creates the illusion someone inside is watching TV, even when you're miles away. Security is a mindset, and fake TV should be part of your security solution. Be vigilant, but not fearful. Faketv.com. Anytime, any place, anywhere, radio remains the most intimate of all forms of media. At home, at work, in the car, on smartphones. Over 90% of consumers still listen to radio every week. That makes choosing radio as a place to advertise your business one of the best decisions you can make. Email advertise at GCNlive.com and partner up with an experienced GCN representative. Advertise at GCNlive.com. Easy, affordable, effective. Fully cooked, ready-to-eat bacon. I'm talking thick, meaty, center-cut, presidential bacon. Savory and delicious. I buy some, I use some, I store some. Awesome. No refrigeration needed with a 10-year shelf life. NASA pack technology. Bacon. Fully cooked, fully hydrated, ready-to-eat right from the pack bacon. Or warm and served. Life-saving, ready-to-eat bacon. 10-year shelf life bacon. Ships free at FullyCookedBacon.com. FullyCookedBacon.com. We all know that Berkey Water Purification Systems are the most trusted name in water filtration. As an authorized Berkey dealer for over six years and serving thousands of satisfied customers, the Berkey Guy offers amazing specials for Berkey Water Filtration Systems. The Berkey Light Systems include a set of self-sterilizing and recleanable black purification elements that purify water by removing chlorine, pathogenic bacteria, cysts and parasites to non-detectable levels and remove harmful chemicals such as herbicides and pesticides. Order the Berkey Light System 
system today, complete with two black Berkey elements for only $231. And the Berkey Guy will ship your order free of charge. With the purchase of a Berkey Light, the Berkey Guy is also offering a set of fluoride and arsenic filters for only $39.99. That's over 30% off the retail price. Call the Berkey Guy at 1 877 886 3653. That's 1 877 886 3653. Or order online at goberkey.com. That's goberkey.com today. The answer to being in control of your own health care is freedom from insurance. Become part of a group of self-pay patients that come together to share in each other's medical expenses. Individual share amounts begin at $107 a month and $347 for families. Choose from three health sharing programs. Holistic treatments may be eligible for sharing. See guidelines. Discount programs available for dental, vision, and pharmacy. Go to libertyoncall.org. That's libertyoncall.org. Hey, this is Marie D. Jones, the author of This Book is from the Future, and you are listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. We continue with David Halpern. Earlier on, we had Eric Von Dannigan for the first half of the show, and there are hopes we'll have him back on in the future because this was a fascinating debate among two people who have been doing these studies for many years. All right, looking at these chariots, we assume then that it's a description of a physical chariot, not something that came from outer space. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're now working, we're now running the, a completely different scenario which from, from, from Eric's, which you'll see in a moment I don't totally agree with either, which is that what Ezekiel is describing is something that would, in the first first chapter of his book, something that would have been familiar to people living in the ancient Near East, not from reality, but from myth, from sculptures on ancient temples, from legends that they transmitted. I mean, whoever minted this coin from Gaza must have had an image of a bearded male god riding a winged chariot with prominent wheels. Is that what Ezekiel describes? And it's true that what he describes has some resemblance to it, but it's not quite the same. Ezekiel sees four wheels. They seem to be sometimes on the ground, sometimes rising. They have eyes all around them. That's E-Y-E-S. There's something going on in that first chapter of Ezekiel that can't be explained simply by the Gaza coin. Similarly, Ezekiel sees four living creatures, with four, each one of which has four faces, the face of, a, of an ox, the face of a lion, the face of an eagle, and the face of a human being. Now, in ancient art, we know, from Babylonian art, Egyptian art, we know of composite being, human and animal. The problem is there are almost always animal figures with human faces. The Egyptian sphinx is the best, is a great example of, or the winged bulls with human faces on Assyrian temples. There's nothing quite like Ezekiel's human figures with four faces, three of which are animal. So I don't know where Ezekiel is getting that from. To try to explain it purely as the art of the ancient Near East emerging in his fantasy seems to me inadequate. But to see it as extraterrestrial visitors, to me, is a total non-starter. What would ox, lion, eagle, face be doing on extraterrestrial visitors? Orton did a really ingenious try at that by trying to depict how Ezekiel would have envisioned a man-like being wearing a space helmet and a breathing apparatus which he thinks would look like an ox or, or an eagle. 
but I, I, I come away unconvinced. So what exactly have we got in the first chapter of, of Ezekiel? And I must tell you that after 50 plus years of studying it, I still don't know. Let me ask you kind of another offbeat question here. We have the legends of Atlantis, Lemuria, yeah. possible civilizations that existed right here on Earth that were far more advanced. And due to whatever worldwide cataclysm or whatever might have occurred, those civilizations went away. Yeah. Is it possible that we're seeing here descriptions of remnants of a more advanced ancient civilization instead of spaceships? Wouldn't rule it out, Gene, but I have to say I would look in a totally different direction, and that's the direction that Carl Jung pointed toward, that there is something in our shared unconscious as human beings that's going to erupt in visions like Ezekiel's. And that's where that my idea about the giants is a very is a very simplified version of this, that there is something in our unconscious, both as individuals and shared, that gives rise to these things. Now, I don't know if you know Greg Bishop, who was someone who's been a theorist in the UFO field for a number of years, and he has a co-creation theory, which is certainly related, where when we have UFO type experiences, we are in part, to some degree, creating elements of that experience. We're interacting with something, but we're also participating. I have no doubt that we are the main creators. My, my own view is that when that the UFO sightings that are not obviously to be explained as heavenly bodies or balloons or whatever. Or, yeah, I mean, co-creation, I, I, I wouldn't have used that term, but yeah, it's not a bad way of saying it, that there is indeed something out there, possibly something quite mundane, and that there is something within us that creates the vision that emerges. So that leaves then a possible core reality, correct? I would say a core reality within us. Is What's, it totally, do you feel within us, you don't feel there's anything external involved in that? I don't think so. I don't think so. But then I'm obliged to ask, what is us? What is our unconscious? Does it, as Jung thinks, thought, does it somehow extend to the entire species? And here it seems to me we are treading on very, very obscure ground. And I feel myself picking my way with great hesitation. Well, it's certainly interesting to check this out, to consider all the possibilities of UFO visitations. But then... What we would also mean here, if it was a collective unconscious, as our culture changes, the form and shape of this would change. Oh, yeah. And that may be why when we look up at the sky, we see flying machines and Ezekiel saw visions of God. You see what I'm saying? There may be some shared stimulus, which I would see as somewhere inside us, inside Ezekiel, that because of the external culture, we will conventionalize in a way different from his. Now, if UFOs are by and large internal to us, what do they signify? That is a terrific question. I think it could... Uh, I'll, I'll give you one very, uh, first of all, I'll give you one very simple example, and then I will suggest something much more speculative. And this, have you, have you ever, in, ever interviewed Eric Wellett on this program? Yes. Oh, you, yes. Okay. Did he talk about his work 
with the Belgian UFO wave of 1989 to 1990. It's a while since we had him on the show, but I believe he did. Yeah, because I think his observation on the on, on the Belgian sightings is quite brilliant. What the, that uh, there was a, a a considerable wave of of UFOs that were seen over Belgium, nowhere else in the in in, uh, in the region but Belgium, from the end of November 1989 down through the spring of 1990. And although they came in many different shapes and sizes, the one that was most common was a, a, a flying triangle with three bright white lights at each one of its tips and a weaker red light in the middle. Now, what Eric pointed out is that where these so people were able to photograph these things what they got on what came out on the photographic image was either nothing at all or just blobs of light. So whatever people were seeing was not there in any physical sense. We are yeah, going to continue this speculation about UFOs and the possible sources of such mysteries with David Halperin. More to come. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> Thank you for listening to GCN. Be sure to visit GCNlive.com today. We also have swag. You know, we have all these exclusive Paracast things that you can buy. We've got like, I guess, 60 or so different items and entails T-shirts, sleeves for notebook computers, iPad cases, mouse pads, the Paracast Jumbo tote bag, all sorts of T-shirts and jackets and stuff like that for men and women. We have a Paracast aluminum water bottle. All this stuff, you go to store.theparacast.com, store.theparacast.com. What makes it special is that the items are the best quality, you know, great T-shirts, fabrics, and they have our official logo on them. That's what makes them special in multiple sizes and colors. We even have stuff for children, stuff for women, stuff for men. We have all sorts of sizes, like small up to X large. A lot of good stuff. That's the swag from the Paracast. If you go to store.theparacast.com, stop by and take a shopping tour. Hawaii was a wake-up call. Don't be caught without a disaster shelter. Atlas makes an all-disaster shelter that will protect your family from fallout, tornadoes, and hurricanes for only $99.99. That also includes the NBC air filtration system, solid steel construction with an airtight bulletproof door. That's right, for $99.99 and up, call 1-855-4-BUNKER or go to IWantThatShelter.com. Atlas Survival Shelters, the world leader in fallout shelters. Are you one of the 70% of Americans that want to own your own business, afraid to leave the security of your current job to pursue your dreams? I'm Pharmacist Keith. Dr. Wallach, the Dead Doctors Don't Lie guy, and myself want to show you a low-cost way to create your own business, working around your current job schedule, creating an extra income for you and your family by joining his crusade, spreading his message of better health. To learn more, visit radio.recordedvideo.com, radio.recordedvideo.com. That's radio.recordedvideo.com. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. Quick reminder that we have a second radio show called After the Paracast, and you can only get a copy if you subscribe to the Paracast Plus. For more information, go to plus.theparacast.com. Plus dot theparacast.com, where you'll learn how to subscribe. It's a low fee starting at just $1.49 a week, $4.99 a month. And if you have long-term subscriptions, you get more some freebies too. We also give you the commercial-free version of this show. We're looking here at some of David Halperin's ideas about UFOs in relation to a collective unconscious. Or is Mother Earth sending us a message? It implies shared. 
Yeah. Yeah. So what are we sharing here? Is there still some kind of external mystical source? Well, or do we finish. just create our own little database here? Well, let me finish well, what Eric discovered. And this is not Eric von Deniken, but Eric Wellett. That, that, that people were seeing these triangles that would not appear on photographic images. So what were they seeing? Well, Eric pointed, Eric pointed out that the November 1989 was not an uneventful time in European history. On November 9th, the Berlin Wall came down and that it was clear that communism was crumbling in Central and Eastern Europe. So what people were seeing was the dimming red star, the symbol of communism, hemmed in by three bright white stars, which was the symbol of NATO. So that people were projecting into the skies what they could feel going on in the culture around them and put them in a form which Jung's the psychological theories would lead us to expect, the quaternity. That is the archetype of a four of which three are different. One is different from the other three. So this is what I think the Belgian UFOs were conveying. That is an awareness of momentous changes that were going on in the world, in the continent, around them. Is it what all UFOs mean? I don't think so. In the famous case of Father Gill and his so close-up sighting of flying discs in 1959, I think these function as symbols of reconciliation of the conflict between him and his parishioners. I think that most deeply, the UFO is a representation of the ultimate alien, which is death. The thing here I'm going to ask also here is, we assume the modern UFO era occurred in 1947, although we can find cases older than that. Was there anything in our society beyond the beginnings of the Cold War and the end of World War II to trigger the so-called UFO myth on June 24th, 1947? Okay, well, here we're getting into big speculation, okay, which I will label it as such. Sure. June 1947 was the beginning of the UFO era. It was also the first month in which the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists began to publish the Doomsday Clock on its cover. This was the era from which, in the, for the first time, the collective death of the human species became a real possibility. And I think that this was what was reflected in the coming of the UFOs and in the story that was later told about this period, which is the Roswell story, of which, if you think about it, the essential theme of Roswell is death. Of course, we also have the contactee movement where they came here to tell us that E.T. was warm and fuzzy and wanted everyone to live in peace with brotherhood. Yeah. And that was the opposite. Yeah. But I think you can have one of the things myth will do is confronted with an overwhelming stimulus, come up with opposite reactions to it. One is to acknowledge the reality of death as at Roswell child humanity, like Icarus, tries to zoom into the heights and crashes to permanent extinction. And then the other is the comforting reaction against this, 
the comforting response to say, okay, the Space Brothers are here looking out for you. Now, with the contactees, are we assuming here that maybe they had at the core of it, at least some of them, a real experience of some sort, whereas others just made it all up? I have no idea at all. I have no idea at all. I know that Jung took Orfeo Angelucci very seriously. I must say that when I read Angelucci's Secret of the Saucers, I was not quite as impressed as Jung was. But I do find myself haunted by, by little questions as to why, why these things would occur to a man named Orfeo Angelucci. That the second part of his, his, his last name connects him with angels, and Orfeo connects him with Orpheus, the man coming back from the dead. So I don't know. I think there may have been more to the contactees than met the eye. So is it here that at least some contactees, they have an experience, they get their 15 minutes of fame, and now they want 30 minutes of fame. So rather than just tell the same story, they have expectant followers who want to hear more. And so they invent new stories. I wouldn't rule it out. I mean, I think that that perhaps Angelucci, who ha- at least the, the, the ultra-cynical Long John Nebel, speaks of always being impressed with Angelucci's sincerity. I think he's probably going to be in a different category from George Adamski, who has always struck me as a huckster from beginning to end. Do you think any other contactees might have had a genuine experience? Let me just give you one story that you've probably heard before. And it goes back to a meeting that Jim Mosley and I had back in the mid-60s with Howard Benger. And Benger was often referred to as the Jersey Adamski because he met similar types of people. Except instead of photographs, he'd give you paintings. He was a sign painter. And then we met him for lunch across the street from Jim's office at 303 Fifth Avenue. I've told the story in the Paracast before, so you can skip past it if you don't want to hear it. Where Menger says there that he thinks he was part of some kind of government experiment to test reactions to different events. It was staged for his benefit. And that's not an unknown theory. What do you think? I have no idea. I have no idea. The only thing that I could say is that that would suggest that there was some genuine experience he had. Would that seem so to you? Well, in this case here, we're talking about something that, as far as he was concerned, was genuine, but was staged for him by the government. Where was the government involved, for example, in early UFO research? And I'll bring Roswell up as an example. There's obviously the book, from Nick Redfern called Body Snatchers in the Desert, speaking of a failed experiment, human experiment, that generated the Roswell myth. We've got more to come about now, possible sourcing of the Flying Saucer Mystery and more with David Halperin. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in. The Paracast. <laughs> Attack of the Rockoids has been well-received by critics and readers alike. It's a -a thrill-a-minute story you'll never forget. A former U.S. military intelligence officer is haunted by intense dreams about a beautiful woman pleading for his help after a terrible battle in outer space. But the dreams turn out to be true and thrust him into a telepathic love affair with a woman whose faraway planet is intent on destroying the Earth. And now the gripping tale continues in The Coming of the Protectors. It's the second book of the Rockoids trilogy, a galaxy-spanning adventure that pits our hapless heroes against powerful, fanatical enemies that threaten the lives of freedom-loving beings everywhere. Attack of the Rockoids and The Coming of the Protectors, classic science fiction at its best, available now. For more details, visit rockoids.com. That's R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S dot com.
Here's a special message for those of you who owe the IRS at least 10000 or more in back taxes. The IRS has special programs in place that could eliminate or reduce your tax debt by thousands of dollars. Call the Federal Tax Management Helpline that has been set up for you, 800-503-8625. Stop the wage garnishments, levies, and tax liens now. Once you've qualified and enrolled, the IRS will stop all the collection activities against you. These unique programs have been allocated to help the economy and significantly reduce reduce or eliminate your tax burden. The IRS is currently accepting reduced settlements and other favorable programs. You may qualify for substantial savings, so get the help you need. If you owe more than 10000 in taxes, call for free information and to see if you qualify. Take down the number now for the Federal Tax Management Hotline, 800-503-8625. That's 800-503-8625. 800-503-8625. Many medicines used to treat colds and flu contain acetaminophen, a pain reliever and fever reducer found in hundreds of over-the-counter and prescription medicines. But taking too much or more than one medication containing acetaminophen per day can damage your liver. So always read the label and don't take acetaminophen if you drink three or more alcoholic drinks every day. To learn more, visit fda.gov slash OTC pain info. A message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Food and Drug Administration. It's been said, any society is only three missed meals away from chaos. Those times may be near. Think about it. Our country faces multiple terrorist threats and aggressions from Russia and North Korea. Social unrest and violent marches yet again may lead to looting of stores and city shutdowns. And our crumbling infrastructure leaves our power grid vulnerable to long-term outages from a single cyber attack. When the chaos from any one of these threats arises, the government knows it can't provide during a widespread national emergency. That's why you need your own plan for self-reliance. That's where My Patriot Supply comes in. Get a four-week survival food supply for only $99. That includes breakfast, lunches, and dinners. Order online at preparewithgcn.com. 99 bucks for four weeks of survival food that tastes like homemade cooking and lasts up to 25 years from My Patriot Supply. Get your kits today at preparewithgcn.com. Free shipping is included. Preparewithgcn.com. Ted Anderson telling you about Jordan Rubin's Beyond Organic Green-Fed Raw Cheddar Artesian Cheese featuring whole milk created through ancient dairy breeding, unpasteurized, untreated whole milk on the same farm the cows graze, containing natural sources of omega-3s, CLA protein, calcium, probiotics, and enzymes. I have never tasted cheese this good, and you need to try it. Contact your Longevity distributor or call 877-878-4203 or go to GCNteam.com. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. We have David Halpern for a couple of more segments, actually three more segments, and we're speculating here. So what is your perception about that? Do you think that maybe... The government had some early involvement in UFO-related episodes? I always tend to be skeptical of such assumptions. My, my sense is that the government has known a great deal less than most of us assume. I don't know that these latest revelations about the secret Pentagon UFO project really change that, although they do suggest that there were at least people in the government who took UFOs more seriously and wanted to know more about them than were generally, were generally told. I have to say, I, I really cannot answer that. What about things like UFO abductions? Is that a collective unconscious experience, something personal, I think uh, sleep a, paralysis? Yeah, uh, sleep paralysis may play a role. I don't know that it explains too much, since we'd have to explain the imagery. What has struck me, it seems to me there's a number of different elements in this. First of all, there is certainly an element of sexual trauma. 
that the abductees report being violated by their captors in ways that suggest sexual abuse. And in at least one case, you can see a woman who remembers a fishing trip with her father in which she's pretty sure her father raped her, then uh, regressed by the late Bud Hopkins. She remembers that it was really aliens who raped her while her father stood watching. And then the next morning, she's not so sure she really thinks it was her father who did it. Something apparently happened. She came back from that trip with blood in her underpants. My own reading of that was that her father indeed raped her, and she came up with the abdu the abduction pseudo-memory as a way of expressing that. But I think there's more. It strikes me as significant that we can trace back the UFO abduction tradition to an interracial couple of whom at least the man, the black man, Barney Hill, when uh, his memories began to surface, was so frightened, he thought he, the, that the psychiatrist who was hypnotizing him thought he was going to throw himself out the window. And if you compare what Barney Hill experienced, what is at the core of the UFO abduction, it sounds very much like the abductions that Barney Hill's ancestors would have experienced in Africa, being abducted in the middle of the night, taken aboard an alien ship, and given medical, what seem like medical examinations. So I think that something of the historical trauma, the African-American trauma, is playing a role in the abductions. And finally, I think there is something more that go, that's much more ancient that it's playing into. And here, perhaps, we're moving into Eric von Deniken's territory, except I don't think it's real aliens. The, there was an ancient form of Jewish mysticism called the Merkava mysticism, in which people underwent journeys toward the chariot. And their experiences of these journeys reminds me very much of the process of hypnotic regression of abductees. And finally, I don't know, do you know the whole business with the Predionica mask and Whitley Strieber? Would you tell our listeners about this? Okay, that in 1987, Whitley Strieber's book Communion was published. And on that cover, on the cover of Communion, was the face that we always associate with the UFO alien, or at least we do since that book was published. It was unknown before 1987. A kind of light bulb shaped face with enormous jet black oval eyes. Now, in, 19, in the mid 1950s, archeologists found in what's now Kosovo, an ancient sculpture, which has a face almost identical to that. Now, I think Eric could point to this, Eric von Däniken, as evidence for his views of ancient astronauts, like that there were extraterrestrials visiting Kosovo in uh, some 6,000 years ago. But I really don't think so, because this face fits quite smoothly into the evolution of the prehistoric art of that time and place. So how are we to explain the resemblance? One possible explanation is that the artist who painted the picture at Whitley Strieber's direction had seen photos of the Predionica head, as it's called, that was the place where it's found, and was using that as a model. I also think it's possible he was doing that because there is something in that face that resonates 
to our psyche. And it is a fact that thousands upon thousands of people seeing that face on the cover of communion remembered that they'd experienced, they'd seen it before, that they'd experienced something involving that. Is this then in part a racial memory? Or call it collective memory. Yeah, we're, uh, as all roads lead back to Jung, except where they lead to Freud. Well, I kind of think here it's fair to say that Whitley Strieber had an experience that was deeply psychological. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't rule that out for a moment. I think that if you look at the hypnotic regressions, he quotes in his book, it's clear that there is some sexual abuse behind that and that that's personal. But is it possible there's more than that? That he's plugging in to something much wider, just as Barney Hill with what I think was his reenactment of the historical African-American trauma of slavery was plugging in to something bigger than and wider. I think that's what UFOs are, something bigger than why and wider. And that's why I think they're a myth. And that's why I think they're real. I'm going to ask you a few other questions about UFOs and possible origins in our next segment. We're talking to David Halperin, UFO researcher, biblical scholar, and a lot more. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> Thank you for listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. Anytime, any place, anywhere, radio remains the most intimate of all forms of media. At home, at work, in the car, on smartphones. Over 90% of consumers still listen to radio every week. That makes choosing radio as a place to advertise your business one of the best decisions you can make. Email advertise at GCNlive.com and partner up with an experienced GCN representative. Advertise at GCNlive.com. Easy, affordable, effective. The answer to being in control of your own health care is freedom from insurance. Become part of a group of self-pay patients that come together to share in each other's medical expenses. Individual share amounts begin at $107 a month and $347 for families. Choose from three health sharing programs. Holistic treatments may be eligible for sharing. See guidelines. Discount programs available for dental, vision, and pharmacy. Go to libertyoncall.org. That's libertyoncall.org. People search the internet for everything, including you. With a few clicks, information from your past can be quickly discovered. From business deals gone wrong, to misleading reviews, negative articles, and unflattering images. Studies show 78% of people search for someone online before doing business with them. Will they find the real you? With ReputationDefender.com, you can establish a positive internet presence. ReputationDefender.com pioneered the field with over a decade of experience, serving thousands of successful individuals and businesses. We use patented, award-winning systems to boost positive content and suppress negative material. Don't let the internet define you. Take control of your reputation today with ReputationDefender.com. For your quick, free reputation analysis, call 800-831-0771. That's 800-831-0771, 800-831-0771, or visit reputationdefender.com. Hello, my name is Marjorie Wildcraft. I'm the founder of The Grow Network, which is an online community of people who produce their own food and medicine. We are really into backyard self-reliance. If you want this lifestyle, I suggest your first step be to learn some basic home medicine. Just the other day, my 18-year-old son came to me and said, Mama, I got a sore throat. Can you fix me up? And I said, Sure, Ryan. And in about 24 hours, he was better. The best home medicine for you to start out with is garlic. It's an amazing natural antibiotic, and I can show you how to use garlic to handle ear infections, sore throats, colds, and flus. As a way for you to get to know a little bit more about me and the Grow Network, I've written up an easy introduction on how to use garlic. It's at gcnwellness.com. Now, the station manager told me that I needed to say the URL at least twice, even though it feels kind of weird. But if you're interested in backyard self-reliance, you are one of us. 
Go to www.gcnwellness.com and let's connect up. Hi, this is Sophie Winnick, longtime distributor and user of Longevity products. In the last few years, my family went through a crisis. Everything else in my life, including my business, had to be put on the back burner. Thankfully, life is getting back to normal now. But the one thing I never had to worry about was my business and my monthly commission. I've been a distributor for Longevity for over 17 years, since before it was Longevity. And I've got to say, the most amazing thing about this company is the people. While my family was in crisis, other distributors stepped in and helped my customers, simply because that's what Longevity people do, even for people they don't know. For me, it has never been about getting rich. It was about a product I could stand behind, a company I could count on, and a monthly commission check that has never not once been late in 17 years. Longevity is truly a business for everyone, even people who have too much to do. I'm Sophie Winnick. I'm just like you. I have a real life, real ups and downs, but I know I will always have Longevity. This is Micah Hanks of the Gray Alien Report, and you're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. Once again, Chris O'Brien is preparing or already on his journey back east. Long trip. And he'll tell us about it when he gets there. We're going to be talking to Pennsylvania UFO and cryptozoological researcher Stan Gordon next week. We have David Halperin joining us now. Do you think, David, at all that there is the possibility that at least some UFOs represent visitors from other planets, physical visitors? No, no, I don't think they do. I don't think they do. I mean, give them one test. Look at the UFOs, the people who pilot the UFOs. Nowadays, we envision them as having those huge Streber-esque eyes because Streber or Ted Jacobs, who painted the, the, the cover for Streber, introduced that image. Before it, that, uh, that image doesn't occur at all. If we're dealing with real visitors, we'd expect more consistency over time. You see, that's the thing that bothers me about UFOs, too, that we have so many different varieties. And, of course, a common theory is, well, we're not being visited by one race. We're being visited by many. Maybe, you know, we're the, the intermediary stopover between here and wherever they're going. Or that it's kind of like we have lots of models of cars, and trucks, different models. But some are so diametrically different, you never know. Plus, again, they take on the cultural meme of the time. And how would they do that if they're, if they're real visitors? I mean, you, 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 you know the story of Antonio Villas-Boas from 1957, that he was taken aboard a UFO, half seduced, half raped by a gorgeous woman on it? I mean... It's a great story, and by all indications, he really believed that it happened to him. But how come nobody else has experienced it? Well, you'd think if we had consistent visitors, we would. But then again, as you say, the variety of UFO cases is something that is troubling. And also the ubiquity. I would think here that if alien visitors were coming here, and they wanted to take soil samples or something. Why would they just be flying around all the time? Wouldn't they just do their thing and leave? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you remember when we were kids, the, with the, everybody was predicting there would be some great epiphany within a few years, which made sense. Either they'd invade or they'd make contact or something. Now, 50 years have passed, and the world hasn't changed at all. I mean, it's changed, but not through intervention of, of, of UFO beings, which to me points to something that is consistent within us that keeps emerging in different forms. After Communion was published in 1987, yeah, the Communion alien be, becomes what people see and experience. 
And I'm saying the words see and experience very deliberately, not that they make it up. And I'm, I'm not using the word imagine. I keep thinking of what a librarian I met in Western North Carolina several years ago told me. She was talking about the UFO aliens she would see on her front lawn through her through the windows of her house when she was a kid. And she said to me, I know they weren't really there, but I did see them. And I believe both parts of her statement. And I want to understand how both parts of it are true. Let me ask you then about physical trace evidence. And we've had that explored by people like Ted Phillips over the years. Do we assume there is any physical trace evidence or that's just something conventional that has been applied to a UFO case? Well, I'd have to say there isn't any to be consistent. But then if you ask me what happened at Socorro in 1964 or what happened at Delphos, Kansas, when was that, 1978? Then I don't know I can give you any good answers. You see, that's why I raised that. That's why I raised it. Yeah, I, I, was, kind of, I was kind of afraid you might raise it. It really is a, uh, I hate to use the cliche, a fly in my ointment. I have to assume there will be some resolution. There is some resolution of these things that we can't think of. The evidence against there, there being, there being sought that there being actual space physical vehicles seems to me so overwhelming, but there are these cases that are really troubling. Also, UFO photographs, are all them conventional or fakes, or have things been captured on film or digital sources that are strange? Yeah, I mean, isn't that a two-edged sword? The skeptics use it, I think, and in this case, I guess I would consider myself a skeptic, they use it to great effect by saying that with all our, uh, you know, our, our, our telephones that function as cameras, all the all the th- the ways we can record things, surely we'd have some really impressive UFO photos by now, which we don't. And I think that's a really good argument. But if you ask me what was photographed at McMinnville, Oregon, in 1950, I don't know. I suppose I would have to say it was. Uh, it has to be a fake. But it doesn't seem like the people, Paul Trent and his wife, were hoaxers. So I don't know what's going on there. Because, again, if these things are just, in a sense, fantasies, personal fantasies, there should be no physical effect. There should be no trace evidence. There should be no photographs. There should right. be no radar contacts. There should be no simultaneous visual and radar events such as Washington, D.C. in 1952. Yeah. The radar doesn't trouble me that much. I'll tell you why. Because we also have cases where there are radar blips and nobody sees anything and where people see something and they don't appear on radar. So I'd be prepared to say that at some, in some cases by coincidence, false radar echoes intersect closely enough with visual observation as to create the illusion of reality. I understand that perfectly well. And it's obviously leaving us with a mystery on our hands here. I also notice here, and I don't know if you want to bring this up, I guess we could bring it up, there has been other theorizing about UFO abductions and near-death experiences having commonalities. Yeah. Now, how would that be? I mean, if you have a near-death experience, we assume that, all right, there's a temporary clinical death for whatever reason. The heart stops beating for whatever reason for a short time and you come back and you remember something. How would that relate to a UFO abduction? I think that the intersection is the memory, that you have a memory of something of enormous significance that you believe befell you. Now, Kenneth Ring has pointed to a, 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 a correlate 
between both near-death experiences and UFO abductions and childhood sexual abuse, which I think is significant. And I think also this would play into my hunch that death is a fundamental element in what UFOs mean to us. All right, we're going to ask you the obvious question, how so? In our final segment with David Halperin, and he's somebody I've known for, what, a couple of hundred years now, you think? Oh, at the very least. Oh, yeah, you know, thousands of years. Millions, you never know. We're possibly, you know, we don't know what life is, and maybe our souls have interacted and debated UFOs before. You're in. The Paracast. Thank you for listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. As you know, neighbors, web hosting can be pretty cheap, but not all hosting is the same. DreamHost wins best of awards year after year. You get unlimited disk space, unlimited bandwidth, and even the low cost plans put your sites on high performance SSDs. Want to know more about what DreamHost has to offer? Go to technightowl.com slash host. Once again, that's technightowl.com slash host. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at Rockoids.com. That's Rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. One out of four people listening to my voice right now could die from heart disease. This could be your last year, and you don't even know it because you don't know the early warning signs. If you think you're safe because your cholesterol levels are normal, think again, because studies show that 75% of heart attack patients also had normal cholesterol levels. Let me introduce you to Strauss Heart Drops, a world-famous heart and brain formula made in Canada. It's time-tested and will give you clinical results in 90 days or your money back. Learn more at signsofheartdisease.com. They are shipping free this month. It's a no-brainer. A Big Berkey water filter is the one you need, period. You need a water filter that removes chlorine, fluoride, pharmaceuticals, BPA, and other endocrine disruptors, pesticides, bacteria, viruses, and much more, right? And does it all at only two cents per gallon. Get the original, most trusted name in gravity water filtration, Big Berkey. And now GCN listeners receive 5% off ceramic filter systems using code GCN. Call or click 1-877-99-BERKEY or BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com. That's 1-877-99-BERKEY. This is Dan Pilla. Do you owe the IRS money you can't pay? Are tax debts crippling you? I've defended people from the IRS for over 30 years. I've helped thousands and I can help you too. I wrote the book on IRS settlement and I'm telling you, there's no such thing as a hopeless case. Call 800-34-NO-TAX to finally get free of IRS debt. With the IRS's new programs, there's never been a better time to solve your problem. Call 800-34-NO-TAX. That's 800-34-NO-TAX or my website, danpilla.com. Message and data rates may apply. You don't follow the herd. You blaze your own trail. And you're as adventurous in the kitchen as you are in life. Whether it's paddleboard yoga or Peruvian steak, you're the first to try new things. So are we. We're Green Chef, the first USDA-certified organic meal kit delivery service. We offer delicious meal plans for seven different lifestyles. Paleo, gluten-free, keto, vegetarian, vegan, carnivore, and omnivore. Want to be the first of your friends to try Green Chef? Discover our exclusive introductory deal by texting the keyword FUN66 to 543543. We believe that cooking, just like life, should be all about experience and flavor. And by exploring dinner options with Green Chef, you'll try new recipes, techniques, and ingredients for bold, new restaurant-level flavors. It's like enjoying a new cooking class, but in your own home. To experience this culinary adventure, text now and discover our exclusive introductory deal. Text FUN66 to 543543. That's F-U-N-66 to 543543. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. I'm here to tell you about GCNTelecare.com, a team of board-certified doctors assisting you 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 
365 days a year. Within 15 minutes of registration, care your family can afford. Revolutionizing the healthcare industry, virtual consulting, providing diagnosis of non-emergency medical issues by phone or secure video on computer or smart mobile devices. GCNTelecare.com. Virtual care anywhere. This is Jacques Vallée, and you're listening to the podcast, The Gold Standard of Paranormal Radio. The question of David Halpern was, how so? How so? What of UFOs? And my answer would be that death is the ultimate alien, but also our most intimate companion. We, our death is born with us. It's programmed into us from the first day of our lives. And yet it's the ultimate alien by which we become possibly nothing at all, possibly something so unimaginably different from what we are now that we cannot imagine it's unimaginable. So what better way to represent that death that invades us, that penetrates us, as than through alien vehicles coming into our skies? Alien, let's, instead of vehicles, that's too, too mechanical. Let's say alien entities coming into our skies. What about ghosts? What about them? Well, certainly there, that's taking us close to the image of death. But in a way not, because what is a ghost? I mean, a ghost, my ghost is really me, transparent. Okay, it's like the idea that I keep on in something like my current form, so that I might be recognizable. But the UFO is utterly different utterly other from what we know. So I think it is even better suited than the ghost. I won't say even better suited, better suited than the ghost to convey our our perception of death. So does it give us a place where we think we can go? If it's not heaven, it could be another planet? I don't think it does that. I think it provides a visual, imaginary, tactile sense of a reality that is too enormous for us to absorb. Do you really understand you're going to die? I think people might understand it academically as a concept, but not directly, unless you're really close. How are you going to understand the incomprehensible except through myth? Which brings me back to my statement, which I know sounded paradoxical, that UFOs are a myth and UFOs are real. Myth is what enables us to get some sort of an emotional, intuitive handle on the incomprehensible. Let me ask you here also, we talk about government involvement in UFO research, and I know you had an opinion about Barney and Betty Hill, and of course they also had friends in the military. They were residing near a military base, and I thought if they wanted to have some kind of mind control experiment, this interracial couple would be subject. Do you think our government knows anything about UFOs other than, well, we have no answers as a practical physical level? My guess is uh, that our government knows absolutely nothing about them. So is that why they so readily dismiss it? Because they don't want to say, hey, we don't know what those things are. Or just the factual thing is that UFOs do not represent a threat. Yeah, that's the only question they need to answer. And I think they've answered it quite correctly. 
that after they, they've been saying for 60 years, the UFOs are no threat to our national security. And now it's 2018. And lo and behold, they have not been a threat to our national security. So I think from the government's very narrow perspective, they were absolutely right. And, the, and they're, they're, they're right not to care. Well, do you think then that all the stories about possible disinformation and such like that are just made up? Or do we have rogue elements in the military doing things again for some kind of private reason or some reason in terms of testing the public's reaction to something? I don't know. I mean, I would not have predicted what appeared in the New York Times in December about the Pentagon UFO project. I would not have predicted, by the way, that the New York Times would give front page coverage to such a thing. What do you think that signifies? <laughs> I'm sorry to sound like a broken record, but I don't know. I just find it incredibly weird. I mean, did you read those articles in the Times? I sure did. I know one of the writers, Leslie Kane. Uh, She's been on the show several times. Right. Now, how come, how does she get a byline in the Times? I think she knew somebody there. Yeah, she, yeah, Blumenthal. I mean, but Ralph Blumenthal was another of the authors. She, she made the contact through, through Blumenthal. But it still strikes me as so remarkable that a newspaper should make an honorary uh, correspondent out of a prominent UFO. That, to me, is actually the most interesting aspect of the story. Why the Times acted as it did. Well, she does have a background in print journalism, so it may be partly that. Possibly. Also, remember, she's friendly with John Podesta, former Clinton aide. Yeah, which opens a whole new can of worms. In what way? Well, it struck me, and I think I'm oversimplifying here, but that the liberal Eastern media whom Donald Trump has such contempt for, were the ones that broke this story and dealt with it respectfully. I've seen some discussions of it on Fox News in which the whole idea of UFOs is mocked. Now, I don't want to push this too far because I've also seen on Fox News a respectful interview with Leslie Kane. The one I saw was with Tucker Carlson, and he yes. was somebody I would expect to be totally disrespectful to her. Yeah. But other stuff I've seen on Fox News just made fun of the whole, the whole subject. So is there some political, is in some ways are UFOs, which can be a vehicle for so much as they were in Belgium in 1989, are they now becoming a vehicle for the terrible political splits that we're now experiencing? And now, here I'm really getting speculation. Let me just say one thing before we wrap it up. During one of the press briefings with the press secretary of the White House, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, she was asked what Donald Trump felt about this, and she said, Frankly, she hadn't asked him. She would. And, of course, we know when she says that, there will never be a follow-up. David Halperin, if anyone wants to know more about the things you do, where do they contact you? www.davidhalperin.net I have a website. I have a blog. I have a contact page. I would be very glad to hear from any listeners to the Paracast. You can reach our own Chris O'Brien at OurStrangePlanet.com. You can find the Paracast on Twitter. You can find two Paracast fan clubs on Facebook, a group and a community. Take your choice. Don't forget that our second radio show after the Paracast, it is wrap-up show, special interviews. You never know what to expect next, and you can only get it if you subscribe to the Paracast Plus, go to plus.theparacast.com. That's P L U S 
dot theparacast.com. We offer other features, videos, a version of this show free of the network ads with better quality audio. So David Halpern sounds even better than he could possibly sound otherwise. How about that? More information, how to subscribe, plus dot theparacast.com. Next week, Stan Gordon joins us. David Halpern, thank you so much for teaching us so much about so many things on the Paracast. Thank you for having me, Jim. The Paracast, featuring Gene Steinberg and Christopher O'Brien, is a copyrighted presentation of Making the Impossible Incorporated. Tune in next week for a new adventure in... The Paracast.